and welcome to today's session on how to review a SOC report. I'm Brooke Wells, a senior in our financial services practice group at Barry Dunn. Hey everybody, my name is Josh Clark. I'm a senior manager in our technology assurance team and commercial practice group. My team is responsible for doing all of these SOC 1 and SOC 2 audits that we will be walking through today. Perfect. So I'm going to share my screen for a form um, and it'll help you as you go through your review for the checklist. So what we're looking at on screen is a SOC 1 report review checklist. The purpose of the SOC 1 review checklist is to help you walk through a third party uh, SOC 1 or SOC audit. That is an important piece of your environment. Um, a SOC 1 focuses on controls that are relevant to financial reporting. So in reality, you should be asking a SOC 1 for any vendor that you might have that you rely on for processing transactions or processing information for you. Um, to walk through at the very beginning of this document, um, it's just information, background information, that you can um, pull from the title page. Um, and then obviously it's, it's also specific for your organization. When, when was the review date? Who completed the document? Um, why this is important is we as auditors um, will ask at the end or of, for an audit, we will ask for this information to evidence that you are doing vendor management activities. Um, so documenting this in the checklist helps demonstrate that you are doing ongoing vendor management. Um, so name of the service organization, um, what's your risk rating if you have an internal risk management program that has designated a uh, um, third party risk level. Um, what type of report, so a type one or type two. Um, type one report is a, a point in time meaning that um, it's not over an, a full spectrum of a year or six months, it's as of. So um, a type one audit is really just to prove it once. Uh, that's the way I like to best explain it. It's as of a certain date, the controls that you are, that are in this report um, are in place. While a type two is um, over a period of time. So it's a reporting period that covers typically a full year, sometimes less, sometimes more. It's, it's dependent on um, the organization. Uh, so a period, period covered in the report would be defined on the title page or in sections one and two, um, which you can find pretty easily. Uh, and then documenting the, the audit firm um, that helps to ensure that that firm is a qualified CPA firm. Once you get past the title page, past the table of contents, you'll see that it gets you to an independent service auditor's report. Um, the purpose of the auditor's report is it discusses the scope of the audit and any limitations in place. Within the auditor's report, you'll be able to, to see the exact audit period, um, the opinion, so you'll see um, statements of it being a clean opinion or if there's any quali qualifications or disclaimers. Um, what a qualification means is that a control objective was not able to be satisfied based on the testing that occurred. Um, that could mean um, a control set didn't speak correctly to the control objective or that specific control activities um, that were tested, there were deviations found that impact the control objective as a whole. Uh, and, and the auditor's report have any known subservice organizations that are um, deemed um, necessary as part of the scope of the audit to either include within scope of the audit, which we call inclusive, or carve out of the audit. Um, there will be a paragraph in the auditor's report that describes if it is carved out, um, what's the organization and what services do they provide to the company. Same thing with inclusive. If it's an inclusive audit, it will say 
um, who the company is and what they and what are their responsibilities in the control environment. So when management's looking at these um, these stock reports and it that has these sub sub organizations carved out or um, included, then management should also consider if these organizations perform any functions that um, affect the report users. So for example, if there's a significant impact, management should consider uh, getting the organization stock report and consider looking at how that their controls are incorporated as well. So moving into information provided by the service organization. Um, what this section is, we like to call it the narrative. This is typically section three of the report. Um, section th three of the report describes the control environment. Um, Section two of the report, which we haven't touched on, is the management assertion. That's coming from the, the organization saying that um, we, they are agreeing that the control environment tested was in place and that all uh, evidence provided is factual. So that we want to make sure that there is a section two in, in the SOC audit. Um, and that there is a signature associated within that as well. Um, within section three, you know, we typically suggest making sure that the description of the system includes functions and operations that are relevant to you. Um, if you um, are going through the, the audit description and the scope doesn't seem appropriate for what services the company provides you, um, or to the description of the controls do not um, describe their control environment um, based on what you're expecting. Those are things to take note of and to bring up to that organization. Um, oftentimes, being the auditor of, uh, of these SOC exams that complete them, um, the auditor and the company rely on getting feedback from their user entities to ensure that the control set that they are working on and and um, adding control activities to for their internal environment um, is including all of the expectations of their user community. Uh, so that's a, an important piece to note that um, you know we we want to make sure that there if there's any feedback or anything missing that you can you mark that and can communicate it to the organization. The kind of piggyback off of you there um, real quick. If there's any um, ex exceptions or considerations that um, affect the operations, management should consider if it's a con key control or a process control. Um, the ones that your management should be really concerned with are those key controls. Um, and those are the ones that really affect your operations. So some control areas that might be significant to like employee benefit plans are contributions, including loan repayments, um, distributions and loans, participant data. So including your enrollment information, um, statement generation, compliance testing, some investment fund selections, um, and then also just your general IT controls. Yeah, so the general IT controls that we typically see in a SOC audit includes uh, um, logical security, so user access is a big one, and then, and then network security. So how are they securing their network? So firewall, antivirus, intrusion protection. Those are those are typical controls, general IT controls that we like to see and and ensure that are a part of the SOC exam. And that's just, that's just an important piece to ensure that you know the integrity of data coming in and going out is there, um, and that the data is secure, and and that the environment that you rely on will be made available to you, um, and won't um, hopefully have um, any significant issues. So section four also includes um, any user entity controls. User control considerations is is a, a common title. And that's section three. Um, it's typically found in, in the bottom of a section three, where it will describe the, the companies and organizations expected internal controls at your organization. Um, and what this means is the company is, is stating that, hey, the control objectives and control activities that are you about to see in section four 
are also reliant on this set of user control considerations to ensure the integrity of processing and the security of the, the information. Um, so these, this is an, a very important piece of this document and, and, and really a, an important piece of, of uh, the SOC exam. Um, what we suggest doing with, with the user control considerations is lining that up with your internal controls doing an assessment. So, okay, what, what is the organization stating an internal control at your organization should be? Do you have an internal control that addresses this? If so, what are you doing to test it? How are you documenting that this is in place? Um, really, that's um, the, you know, the core function of um, when we would be getting these uh, checklists is to go to this page, go to this section and and ask questions. OK, you know, there's a description saying that you are responsible for communicating um, new hires and terms so that, you know, the the users in in their system um, can be removed. Demonstrate that to us. So it's a very important piece to document um, not only the control, but also what are you doing in, um, internally to ensure that that control is in place. So just like you're saying, um, these this section is very important for us. Um, basically, if you don't fill this section out, you can't rely on the controls that we talked about in the previous section. This is like your response um, to make sure that there's no gaps. So this is, like you said, very important. So in addition to the user control considerations in section three, you also have a list of subservice control considerations. What the subservice control considerations lists is what controls are being identified that the subservice is responsible for. Oftentimes in a SOC 1, this is um, the, a data center or uh, network security. Um, so those are important to, to just take note of. And it might be something where you can ask the organization for evidence of their due diligence on those vendors. Um, that's if there's an identified subservice organization, um, there should be sections in the narrative and controls that speak to their vendor management process. What are they doing to ensure that the vendors that they're stating is um, a core piece of the services they provide to you that they rely on? What are they doing to ensure that that environment is secure and that it will not impact their operations. So very similar to, to what you're doing with that, with this or with your organization that you requested the SOC uh, report from. They should be doing that from their subservice org. So I thought that would be an important piece just to touch on very quickly. So moving into information provided by a service auditor, um, this section is the documentation of all control objectives and control activities tested. Um, this section um, provides evidence of the tests performed by the audit firm and the results. In section four, you'll see that the control objectives are listed. Um, usually in section four, you'll have a header with the control objective. What a control objective is, is a statement. Uh, controls provide reasonable assurance that and then the statement of what the, what the controls are, are in place. Underneath the control objective are all the associated control activities that help satisfy that control objective. So as you are assessing these control sets, you want to think about, are these, is, it, is this control objective relevant for us? Is this control objective set complete? Are we missing something? If there's been identified deviations in this section, what are they? How could that impact your environment? And that those three pieces will help you determine whether you know your comfort level of the results of the audit, because this is where the results are really described. It says in this checklist to list out all the control objectives. Um, sometimes a control set could be 
seven control objectives. Sometimes it could be 45 control objectives. So um, I wouldn't necessarily say you need to list out all control objectives if, if that's, you know, if the SOC audit is, is quite large, um, but focus on those control objectives that might have issues. So if, if you if there's certain control objectives that have deviations, you want to make sure that those are called out so that you can um, document your review. The other ones that you could focus on too are the ones your key controls um, related to your financial statements and processing like that, um, just to keep that in mind so you're not losing track of those. So after section four, uh, some SOC audits also include a section five. Uh, this is an optional section of an audit report. And what this really does is it's an unaudited section of the report. Um, sections three and four are the audited sections of the report where the auditor has to ensure that everything in there um, they deem as factual. Um, while this section can be informational. Um, oftentimes a section five might be um, something that a service organization is planning in the future or information about the company. You know if the company has been sold or is in process of being sold oftentimes this is it's placed in section five um, you may also see in section five um, management responses to deviations some organizations some audit firms put the responses right in section four in the results of test column others put it in the section five where it's an unaudited um, section so that it, it does make sense if they want to put it in the section five for a management's response to a deviation. Perfect. So it sounds like all of that information is then summarized into the conclusion, which is the very last section of this checklist. And it just is basically going through the rest of the forms that you already filled out and concluding on everything. So if there was a bunch of exceptions, then you would want to dig into what they were and if how they impacted you. And if there weren't, then um, if you're relying on the SOC report, then you can just document it in this section. Um, one thing to really note is that um, this should be performed on an annual basis, this um, going through this checklist procedures, just so that make sh making sure that anything changing from year to year, you're capturing that and any, any new exceptions you're looking into and really um, figure out what happened and how they affect you. Um, so just documenting this annually and making sure that the period you're reviewing is for the same period um, time frame that your financial statements are for. Um, those are the, the big things for sure. This form is available to you guys. Um, Josh, it's on our website. Is that correct? That is correct. It's on our website um, and you can download it and use this um, for all organizations that, that you receive as a SOC exam for. Um, one thing I also wanted to point out is um, if, if the, it is okay if the SOC audit does not cover the exact period of your financial audit, um, it's uh, very typical that that's not the case. Um, in that case, you can also ask the organization for a bridge letter. Uh, the bridge letter comes from that organization, not an audit firm. And, and it just states that the, um, the controls that were in place in the previous issued uh, SOC report are still in, in place according to the management of that company and, and operating effectively. Um, again, it is not an, it's not an audit opinion coming from an auditor. It, it is just management of the company saying that, hey, these controls are still in place. Perfect. So with that, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. We're always available. There's also an Ask the Advisor feature on our website. So you can use that box and um, it'll get sent to somebody within Very Done who is best fit to answer it. And then we'll get back to you. So thanks for joining us today.